What's up, Gabe? Thanks for joining, man. I appreciate you taking time out in your vacation to uh, to chat with a fellow artist. Uh, appreciate that, man. So thanks. My pleasure. It's got some beach vibes right now. I'm looking at the ocean. Feels like it's like em- emblematic of your art. That doesn't suck at all. We're actually heading out to uh, Turks and Caicos in like a week or so. So I'm excited. Oh, to, yeah. uh, I'm excited to get under a palm tree myself, man. Although you live in you live in uh, not too cold of an area. You're in the Bay Area still. It's not too terrible. Yeah. No, it's like 10 days of rain and then 10 more days of rain scheduled. Yeah. My wife is tired of me complaining. So this is my first solo vacation of my life. Oh, a solo <laughs> vacation. All right. There you go. <laughs> That's cool. So listen, Just dude, I, I, I was uh, there's like so many places I want to take this, but uh, in, in doing some research, like trying to like look up old interviews and, you know, follow you. I've been following you on Twitter for forever. And um, I was trying to like find the missing pieces of Gabe Weiss, the mystery. And um, I don't see a lot of stuff about like your, your personal life, your childhood. And I, I always like starting there because I feel like people like us that make a pursuit of art in a professional way generally have either a unique or weird childhood or like certain parts of them that they kind of manifested into where they are now so like can you like dive into like what who Gabe Weiss as a little kid was and maybe where the sparks of creativity sort of came from yeah I think some of it I don't share is because I don't I don't want to say I was too basic but like I grew up in central Illinois and um my dad was a professor my mom worked in special special ed and i i had a pretty like just vanilla growing up i mean it was like very nice like town was nice um we were pretty poor until i was like 10 because my dad was going to grad school but other other than that got to spend some time in brazil while my dad was writing his dissertation that's probably like the one unique part of my childhood yeah. other than just kind of being very kind of middle class, like not a lot of problems. I was like student body president in okay. high school and captain of the football team. Kind of just like this all American kid. Yeah. Um, went to, went to university of Wisconsin and Madison and got exposed to some uh, psychedelics that I think just kind of like, change the whole like blue yeah i was like went from pretty basic to like having these very abstract thoughts like pretty quickly okay um so yeah i art was always like i took ap art in high school i was always good in art but it was like not my passion i always wanted to do politics oh and really so, okay so i come from a political background in the last 20 years i was working in politics okay um just became a full-time artist a little over a year ago that's like Uh, interesting because it's like i feel like most as a as a stereotype i feel like most artists i talk to generally have uh, more difficulty getting into like the more structure side of things the more business but then it's like you're telling me you you kind of came out at the opposite where it's like you had kind of like a leadership and structure with team sports and a good a good upbringing and you sort of had like the structure and organization and maybe let's say like the left brain side kind of was more worked out and then it was like you use psychedelics maybe some other experiences in life and you're like saw like the right brain stuff was happening whereas a lot of artists Mm -hmm. are like the opposite like for me i wasn't in it was not in team sports at all and uh but i was always into business and that that was sort of the other the other direction i actually spent a a, a smidge of time in illinois as a kid I, i lived in niles illinois for about six or eight months when i was a kid was that close to where you were uh central it's pretty close like that well it's central illinois it's like dead center bloomington normal it's a little college town got it it's a lovely place to grow up but it's like most people there are happy to stay there there's like the state farm headquarters is there okay like everyone's like kind of middle class up upper middle class not everyone Mm -hmm. obviously but pretty good percent I, f- I feel like a lot of this is starting to make sense because we, we share some mutual friends and whenever your name has been brought up in conversation, the first thing almost everyone says is how like down to earth and like nice you are. And maybe that is a reflection on like your upbringing. What do you think about? Is that? I think, yeah. I mean, to be honest, my favorite people on the planet are Midwesterners that either move to California or okay. to New York City. Like, yeah. like, I think there's just a warmth there. 
um, that happens. But then if you really want to stay in the Midwest sometimes, like it's like the people that kind of wanted to leave, but then keep the warmth somehow are my favorite people. <laughs> I'm biased, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> yeah, I get that. I feel like I like I tend to be drawn towards certain people that are uh, just more more like say it like it is people, which for me is like the more East Coast vibe. Everyone kind of like uh, someone told me a while ago, there's a difference between the West Coast and the East Coast, whereas like the East Coast, they were saying are kind, but not nice. And then the West Coast are nice, but not kind. And that was an interesting like way of explaining it, where it's like on the East Coast, people will like go out of their way, help you change your tire in the snowstorm. But then they'll say like, eh, F you, you should have prepared better, you know, like. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. No, that feels about right. A lot of my friends in college end up being New Jersey Jews. Yeah. Like, right here, hey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And then, like, I, I married a Jewish woman, and so, like, for whatever reason, I have been inclined to, like, the just straight-talking, yeah. like, folks who just say it like it is. Like, those are my people. Yeah, just yeah. bums all the time. Yeah, that's that's totally me, man. This this <laughs> might this might explain my next uh, tangent I want to I want to ask you about, because a lot of your work, so you're explaining this, like, beautiful, like, leave it to beaver type childhood. But then it's like a lot of your work is is revolved around like sort of like mental, emotional topics like stoicism and mental health and different things like that. Like, where does that come from? Ayahuasca. OK, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> I mean, not For real. That's like, a little that's a little simplistic, but I do think like a huge part of my artistic journey was ayahuasca okay. and uh like I never showed my art to anyone. It was just my baby. I mean, I paint it almost every night, but I like never would, I refused to show it to people. Okay. And then, um, I mean, a lot of it, I will say the work is a lot of it when I started doing the two faces thing mm -hmm. started from this feeling of like, I want to make art, but like that's like the passion but I always felt guilty because I was really good at politics and I kind of felt like that was the way to make the most impact in the world and okay like, so like there's maybe some catholic guilt in there of like don't you can't just go off and draw pretty pictures while the world's burning like, right it's like you gotta make an impact and so but then this other part of my brain is like but I just want to sit and draw in my room <laughs> What, what do you think it is about politics? Is it like, do you like the, um, cause there's so many sides of it, right? Is, is it like, do you like the debate, like thinking things out, straw manning topic type side of it? Do you like the trying to help people side of it? Like what part of your personality is, is that? And I'm wondering how that connects to your artwork, that side of your brain, that algorithmic part of your brain that like loves that aspect. Impact. Like literally it's just impact. Like yeah. I, I just want to make some sort of impact. I I feel like the world's potential is so infinite. Right. And then like what we're living right now is just so like, we're, it's like, we're so much better than this. Like when you meet average people, like most of them are very kind, want to do well by the world. Like there's just like a huge divergence, I think, between what's possible on earth and what we're living out. And like, I think some of that is that guilt of growing up with the leave it to beaver, like upbringing where it's like, and some Catholic guilt of like, yeah. I know I had it, I had it good. Like, I got a full like scholarship thing to my dad's school to go to college, like, grew up like middle class white guy, like, I just had a lot of things, parents that were not divorced. I mean, I just like, I had a lot going for me. But that always led to the feeling of like, because I had it so well, I need to make an impact. And it wasn't until having a lot of discussions with some friends in like NFT world, where like you're you're making an impact in the world through your art. Like you can make a bigger one through art. That was like the thing, the little switch in my head was like, okay, let's dive into the art thing all the way. It's interesting that there is sort of a comparison because with with politics, like if, if you're so drilled in laser focused on that, like it seems like the world is crumbling and falling apart. But like in actuality, like like you said, most people get along really well when you're walking around stores or wherever you are, like there's not really chaos in the streets. Like it's not as bad as we paint it. And, and there's like a similarity there because like when you're so like like you know in this little bubble whatever your bubble is it seems like that's the only reality and like with nfts that's because that's sort of like an interesting 
way to compare it because outside of NFTs, people have all these misconceptions or all these, you know, preconceived notions. And then when you're in that sort of echo chamber of the NFT world, which largely lives on Twitter, it's a much different reality, you know, like I'm wondering how you sort of, how you sort of reconcile living within that bubble and how that, I'm really curious how that translate translates to your traditional art, like your physical art, because a lot of artists I, I speak to or I'm friendly with, in the NFT space have a really hard time translating that to actual paintings and physical work. And you've done like a really amazing job at like making a name for yourself in both digital NFT space, as well as traditional art. I'm wondering how you sort of reconcile those two worlds, those two realities. I mean, I, I like the NFT stuff is almost through these like baby eyes. Like I never made digital art. It was about a year and a half ago when I bought my first iPad. Okay. So my first yeah. NFTs were just like high res scans of my paintings. And then I start diving more into the world. Like I got to do better. I got up my digital game and so it started playing in, in that world more. But like just some newness. I, I just, I'm really... Like my whole art practice, I didn't go to art like art school or anything like that. What I've always done is just go to the art store mm -hmm. and buy something new that I don't don't have yet, and then just right. see if I can do something cool with it, or like buy a mirror and then paint on a mirror and just see if that's a cool effect. Like it was never. It's all been experimentation. So I think like the NFTs is that on steroids. Like there's yeah. so much things you can do to experiment and learn. And so it just has gotten me like excited for about two straight years. Like I wake up I'm like, what cool shit can I do now? <laughs> that sort of does like translate to, to tr in traditional as well as NFTs though, right? Like like you said, you, you took like a, a practice of painting on it, whatever shit you found, right? So there is kind yeah. of like that there's like that playfulness that is in your work that I really like. And I'm I'm curious how you from like an artistic point as well as I'm going to pull out your marketing brain as well. How do you get those two to agree with each other? Because like for, for me, I always find it difficult to know which of the many styles or the many different ways I like to create. And with NFTs, there's very much a thing like with collections is very much a thing or like putting things in groupings that make sense to people because I think a lot of people like stuff that's easily digestible. Right. And like, so do you feel that on some level you're limited by the expectations that your collectors and fans and friends have of what you, they, they expect you to do? Like, do you still feel the same freedom of like just trying anything, even if it doesn't fit within the aesthetic of your collection or your style? Does that make sense? Did yeah, I say that yeah. <laughs> no, it's a great, it's a, no, no, it's a great question. I'm just like, I'm just trying to think of biggest a question ever. <laughs> yeah, biggest question ever. I mean, I, I think there, I had a blue phase for a while early on because those were just okay. selling like crazy. And I was like, like, I like blue, like, and they're all selling <laughs> yeah. out instantly. Like, so there was, I think I felt it a little then. Um, now I have the Stoics, it's like a 5K PFP that like, I think people that's probably my most recognizable style but to, to your point like I don't I don't feel a strong obligation I wonder if some point I'll totally change what I'm doing but I think some of it's worked because and I when I advise artists I just think there's a massive difference between physical art and NFTs like I think of them more as like trading cards. Like I always traded a lot of baseball cards growing up. And I'm just like, if people, people are scrolling through Twitter so fast. And if they don't, they're going to give your painting, if you're lucky, five seconds, probably yeah. more like a half second. So if it doesn't just pop on the screen as something that they have to have, it's just kind of like on to the next thing. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I think with the NFTs in general, I just put it through the prism of like, if someone's scrolling and giving this a half second, like, look, would they stop right. for it? And if they wouldn't, then it's probably not an NFT. But like, some of those are like my favorite paint. Like, there's a lot of paintings that just don't necessarily translate to NFTs. Mm -hmm. and so I don't put the, I don't put them out as NFTs. But people love black and white of my original artwork 
Right. But like, I haven't done too many of those in, um, in NFTs, although I did do a, almost a whole collection on Avalanche this year called Conscious Lines. Okay. That is all black and white. So yeah, just, just trying to think like what pops on, on a screen, mostly a phone. Okay. So like, if it doesn't look good on a phone, then right. I don't think it's a good NFT. And like, maybe that'll change. I think it will. Like some of these digital canvases are getting a lot better and, yeah. you know, I, I don't, I'll adapt and evolve with the times, but when the vast majority of people are looking on a phone, I think that's kind of the prism to make your NFTs if you're trying to sell them. If you're mm -hmm. just making art for art's sake, that was me for 20 years, got no beef with you. It's like those are some of my favorite people are just the artist types, but yeah. you know, with kids, I got to make enough money to, to survive. So, uh, right. You know, I care about, I, I do care about the marketing. So like, I'm going to drill into that question a little bit, a little bit more, if that's okay. Cause I'm really curious about that. Um, so like, I'm thinking someone like yourself who obviously at this point, thank God for your family, you've got a financial stability, you've got a great following, you've got a good reputation. It, it's some, and especially someone that like yourself, who's dabbling in other things, other chemicals that may or may not like boom, open up your mind. Right. Like, I know as a fellow artist, sometimes you just come up with the weirdest freaking shit. Like you're sitting there sketching and you're like, where the hell did that come from? If you come up, if you're like sitting there on a solo vacation in Cabo and you're, and someone's like, Hey bro, you want to try this, whatever. And you take it and you're like zoning out and you did a collection of like oranges with seven eyeballs, but you're like super stoked on it. Would you release something that's totally not in your style or would you just hold on to that because it's not good marketing? I think it's like finding the right place for it, right? Mm -hmm. So the black and white stuff was like very experimental. And so I did it on a chain that I had just learned about because they approached me. So it was like Avalanche. <laughs> Why not? Sure. Yeah. Like so I I think it's like if you I wouldn't necessarily put random stuff on my main like open sea collection that's made right. kind of my name for myself. Mm -hmm. But to your point, a little grouping called Gabe Weiss Oranges. I mean <laughs> right. I'm I'm doing banners for the first time next week on Coinbase as a drop. Mm -hmm. And so I've never kind of done these like very long dimensions and it, it just changes the game. I, I'm curious how it goes because it's almost the opposite of what I'm saying as far as something that pops. Like right. they're a little bit more like fine. They come from fine art. There's some of my favorite paintings I ever did at kind of that kind of scale, but I mean, I don't know if they like pop in the same way. I think they make really dope banners for people for their like open sea page or Twitter <laughs> page. Mm -hmm. But, you know, time, time will tell. That's just like kind of an experiment. I wanted to try something new, go yeah. kind of outside of traditional dimensions. It's interesting you say that because this is another thing I have on my, my list here in front of me of stuff. I was taking notes and uh, some of our mutual friends, I was like, what kind of stuff should I talk to Gabe about? You know, like, let's let's chat, you know, and people that know you said a couple of people had mentioned how you are excellent at pivoting, which I thought was really a cool, a cool skill. Like it's a cool artistic evolutionary skill to pick up to be able to kind of have enough um, insight to kind of like have have enough uh, consciousness on your radar and know when and how to to pivot and to when and how to try and experiment i'm like wondering how long you think that took to kind of figure out in this space specifically but also on a little bit deeper level like how do you think that came about because that's really a skill that's really hard for people to learn and understand the idea of being able to see where where your place is where you fit in how you fit in and then having enough foresight and, and time and energy to think this is where I see things going like with the banners or like with trying different marketplaces, different styles. It seems like you're really great at like knowing where you should be. It's like that, um, that Gretzky quote of like being where the puck is going. I think you're really good yeah. at that from what I see. I don't know if I've heard that compliment before, but I will take it. I like it. Okay. Uh, I, I think some of it is stoicism, right? Like it really, I, to me, like stoicism, which I've been studying for a few years, like before NFTs was this idea of you have to adapt. And 
I think there's some sort of self-awareness there that you need to have of like, okay, this is where I am. This is where I want to go. How do I get there? And then just, yeah, like rolling with the punches, like things happen. This market I think has had like, I mean, now we're in like this super bear, but even before that, like I was crushing for so many months and then May, 2021 came along and like ETH went up to like, four thousand dollars and no nfts are being sold practically and then i i sold like a painting um to mondor like a big collector out of the uk he was like real active on Mm -hmm. clubhouse early on and like that kind of re restarted some stuff and then i got it featured on OpenSea, and that restarted stuff and then just understanding that like there's going to just kind of be these cycles within it. And I have to be comfortable with that. I mm-hmm. think the NFTs, no one says it, but I think they're one of the worst things for mental health that have ever been created. Mm-hmm. I love them with a passion, but I also think like <laughs> for artists in particular, like before, if I sold a painting, no one knew it. They didn't know the price that it went for. They didn't know right. how long it had been up up for sale and now you're just so exposed like to to everyone looking like oh gabe's not selling this thing (laughs) he always sold out in a minute now this thing is taking three days and like freaking out like oh it's all over now right i messed this up and so i think for me it's like why the stoicism matters why this idea of adapting matters is that like things are going to change dramatically. Like NFT, like, I don't think we'll call NFTs NFTs within probably a year. Yeah, I agree. I think it's going to be digital assets. I think everything will be a digital asset. Yeah. Like I'm personally a lot more bullish on NFTs than crypto. Like, but I think NFTs and this concept of digital ownership will be here for for the rest of our lives in like very profound big ways so like i want to lean into it but also not get stuck into the i used to sell it as 20 of 20s for two grand or like half an e and i did it by just tweeting this thing out it's like kind of like just knowing and not in a bad way, but I think people are like too afraid to take other people's ideas Mm -hmm. when it comes to marketing or something like there's so many things that like you just pick up and like some people like, Oh, he did that. Like, yeah, he did it. He told you about it. Like it's working for him, for him. Like maybe that's a good thing to pick up and do yourself. Yeah. Thing. So, I mean, I think I've done a lot of things that I would recommend to artists like that just work that maybe I picked up from someone or maybe I just thought of myself, but like, I just think there's a lot of in politics. A lot of times we talked about, it's like hitting singles versus grand slams. Okay. (laughs) Like just showing up every day and like doing the little things that will move the needle instead of like almost expecting this one piece or this one collection or this one collector or being in this one show is going to be the thing that changes your life versus I like start working on your email right now. You can always be every day adding an email or two to your email list and you start doing stacking those over a year and now you have hundreds of people that like your work and that before a drop you can email them and tell them i'm doing a drop i mean i've got like three thousand people email list and so most of my drops are like 15 of 15 it's like i only need less than one percent of the people on my email list to buy and that I just don't see a lot of artists kind of thinking that way. I feel like they're looking for some grand slam or like this one break versus like what's in your control as an artist. And then like, how do you just like keep pushing that, that ball up the hill sort of thing. 
it's it's so interesting because when things were in like that bull market like a year and a half or whatever it was ago i lost track whenever that bull market thing was happening though it's so funny because these artists would come into the space and they're like i've been trying to sell my nfts for like three days and nothing's selling i'm like really like i've been trying to sell art for like decades and it's taken me <laughs> you know like this long of like you know how many freaking failures i have in my my life you like you know how many sure. struggles i've had to try to get where i get and then you know people will see me selling uh paintings for large amounts of money and i'm like it took me like a fucking long time to get here you know and then people come into the space with these crazy expectations like i've been trying to sell nfts for a month they haven't sold anything i'm thinking about quitting i'm like you got to be kidding me like you said it really is about like those little wins just kind of stacked up and like the newsletter thing is great advice for artists. I tell people that all the time. Like I feel like whenever I send a newsletter out, it almost always monetizes because those are like, that's like your core, your core audience, your core followers. So I think that's like superb advice. Um, I'm curious, you mentioned before you sort of implied about how you're like your political background sort of transition to art because you feel like you're making an impact. I'm wondering what, what you see your artistic legacy holding for you, like maybe maybe uh with a time marker, like right as of right now, but then also where do you see it going? Like, what do you want to look back, you know, when you're an old man and your kids are older and you look back and said, this is what my artistic legacy has been. What do you what do you think of when you think of things like that? Like. I, there's a couple different, I guess, like I, and I'm even torn on that. One of the things that I think is funny that I really like is that. I've really made so much of my art with my iPhone and uh, like a, just, I don't know, an oldish iPad. I mean, not like the cutting edge new one or anything. Right. Um, I mean, some of the best artists in the world do it, but they're like, are like most expensive, wouldn't say the best, but like a Jeff Koons, like one of those little balloon ball things. like. Right like 90 I mean no one on the planet can make one of those except someone who's already a multi-millionaire who then has access to like the best welders in the world you know like it's like it doesn't really teach too many new artists that they can do this sort of Mm -hmm. thing I think like early rap was like what made it profound is like anyone could sit there and you could rap and like or like SoundCloud now, I think is like super fascinating to me. Like I want to, I want to be in the empowering business. Okay. I struggle with like the Stoics was like tons of technical expertise and like months and months. So I struggle with that because like the average artist could not pull off what the Stoics was. I think the vast majority of my NFTs that my art ones, any artist with an iPhone could could do for the most part and i think that to me excites me like i want the legacy to be that all artists on the planet are empowered to do something like pretty magical and have access to the whole world as a market with pretty pretty low bar of entry and i think like that that in a lot of ways is the thing that excites me the most about nfts because when we talk about changing the world which is what my mission i would say is okay like getting a lot of folks like me to become like pretty wealthy after being very you know not for most of my life (laughs) okay we're the, we're the type of people that can make change versus I think if you come from old money, it's like, you're not really, it's hard for you to be a change agent. Right. So I think there's something strong about, or in my head, it's like the, like I, Nyla Hayes, like, I don't know if you know her, she did the long neck yeah. ladies. Yeah. She's like 13 year old African American girl from Philadelphia she's made millions like if she people like her start making millions of dollars like that's how we really change the world and so like that's the stuff that excites me the most about nfts and like why i try to be a champion to a a lot of artists who i know that if they actually make it that they'll Mm -hmm. make a pretty big impact on the planet so it's it's like largely about what you do with where your art took you as opposed to the art itself per se like it seems like that's more dominant like by by achieving certain accolades you could then use that to leverage and 
change the world or impact people's lives. Is that sort of what I'm hearing correctly? I think that's right. I just think art's very, very subjective. So I don't, I just don't believe there's this objectively good art even. Yeah. Like, I like Picasso, but like I've been around someone who's like, that painting's super ugly. I'm like, that's a freaking Picasso that's insanely good. Yeah. But like, just to say like, I, I'm not super big on like the art has to be X, Y, Z. I think it's like, can you tell a story about why that art matters? Mm -hmm. I mean, and then some stuff is so like ephemeral or like hard to possibly put into words. Like I was just at the SF MoMA and I was at the regular MoMA and they both have Rothko's. And I don't know why they're enchanting and incredible. And I can spend an hour just sitting there. Okay. Like both times I spent about an hour looking at them and they just kind of look like fuzzy TV screens, <laughs> but like he did something insanely magical there. Were that, you on like, mushrooms think, at the time? No, no. <laughs> okay. I wish. <laughs> probably, probably some weed, but right. that'll, that'll uh, do it, man. That'll definitely that'll do it. Yeah, that'll do it. <laughs> But to say, like, you can imagine a scenario in which that guy's laughed at and thought of as, like, the worst painter in the world. Right. Or, like, or critically acclaimed and his stuff goes for millions. And, like, I don't think a lot of times, like, it's kind of out of artist's hands. You might be ahead of your time, like a Van Gogh, or be terrible at marketing like Van Gogh probably was, yeah. or, like... Jeff Koons, I think, makes terrible art, if I'm honest. But, like, I think he's insanely good at marketing it. So, right. like, some of the artists that I, like, study the most are, like, some of the ones that I find that have the least good art. Yeah. Because <laughs> I'm like, if someone's willing to spend this on this terrible thing, surely I can make it. Um, <laughs> but, like, what are, they, what are they doing that's, like, like creating a market around this bad art. I, I love hearing you say that. That's refreshing because a lot of people are kind of afraid to say that. Like I, I was just at the Met in this in New York City the other day, actually, with my family. And I was like just staring at pieces. And it's always fun going there with like my kids or with friends because it's like, you know, uh, my kids at this point are used to it. But when my wife and I first started dating, she would we'd go to the museum and she'd look at a piece and she's like, oh, I like it and walk by. And I'd be like, I'd stop her, make her explain, like, why do you like this piece? What is it? You know, what it, about the piece do you like? And now I feel like it's it's gotten to the point where she understands I'm going to do that. So she's careful before telling me she likes <laughs> something. But it, it's cool because like for, I, I do have like a more traditional art background and like I I kind of like cling to the idea whether it's good or bad whoever's listening can can judge but like i think there are some sort of standards with art i feel like they've kind of faded away but i think there is something to say like maybe with uh gourmet cuisine you could you can make an objective argument saying a certain gourmet meal is better than a twinkie but someone still might prefer eat, to eat a twinkie over a gourmet meal so there's like i think there's maybe some objective stuff people can say about certain paintings like you said that aren't good or are good or whatever but that doesn't mean someone should or shouldn't like it, right? It's just like you could like whatever you want. It may may or may not have an objective amount of whatever that holds any kind of historical integrity. Who knows, right? Yeah, I mean, Andy Warhol started using colors that pretty much like mixing colors that no artist had ever mixed and that were considered God ugly. And like now, uh, like people use those color patterns all the time. And I think like, and his work goes for some of the most in the United States. And like, I don't know. I, I think if you're, there's a, there's obviously a balancing line because I want all artists to, to eat and do well. But like when I talk to young artists, most of the time I give them the advice that I don't hear really going out to anyone else. It's just like, right. get a, get a regular job so that you can make the art that like fuels your soul versus mm -hmm. trying to make art to feed yourself, like inherently makes bad art. And like, I got lucky, I think in that, like a lot of my first year of NFTs were like older paintings and some mm -hmm. of them I reworked, but like it, they, all the works were made under this prism of thinking I'll never sell this. This will never have any effect on my, like, can I feed my kids yeah. sort of thing. So they, they came from a very like playful, excited, not worried 
sort of place. And so like, I'm always desperate to just keep that. And I think Mm -hmm. like the really nice thing about the success I've had the last couple of years is that it, I think it does allow me to experiment and not have that like over arching thing going on in my head of like if I don't sell this my kids don't eat the sort of thing because like that just so hard for that not to affect you and anyone that says it doesn't like I just don't think is being that honest with themselves so like for most artists I'm like make sure that all of your basic needs are met outside of art and then anything you sell in art and make that feel like gravy or this thing that you can reinvest in yourself and in your art versus like trying to sell it. But like, I remember getting in quite a few debates early on in clubhouse with that advice where everyone's like, just go for it, quit your job and go all <laughs> in. And I'm like, I just don't think that's good advice. I, I completely relate to that. For me, I actually did the opposite, but it's it's rare that I tell people to do that. Like for me, I, I like always had been um, making art. It's always been my dream. Like all like my entire like early adult life, I was like starting companies, doing side hustles, like doing everything I could to make money. And in the back of my head, I was always thinking like someday I'm going to paint for a living. Someday I'm going to be a fine artist, right? But uh, until yeah. then, it's like I started a skateboard company. I had an entertainment company. I was doing caricatures at parties. I was doing airbrushing at bar mitzvahs. Like I, I was doing so many crazy ass things. But in the back of my head, I would, I was, I was actually going to be a fine artist someday. And I would paint after I would, I would come back from a gig or whatever I was doing. I would paint until like three in the morning. And I, I, I realized that I, like I was getting older, and I'm like, I'm never actually going to make that happen unless I just apply some force and pressure so like i had this insane opportunity to be featured in brazil and uh with my artwork and at that moment i'm like you know what like the universe or god or whatever you believe in is telling me that this is like what you wanted so i i had an i had a company that was paying for all my bills my mortgage my food my insurance and i was like fuck it i'm, I'm dropping the company and i'm gonna do my art for a living and it's been hard as f it's been really hard but I've been able to make a living from my art. That was like uh, 2007. So I've been making a living from my, just my fine art since then, but it's been really hard. And like, it takes a weird obsessive personality to like, to do that because it also, like you said, it, it puts so much pressure on like your creative side and it does take away some of the fun. Like in some ways it was, like you said, a lot easier to just kind of ease into it. I think that's good advice for 99% of the people, what you're saying for sure. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, like I said, I think everyone's everyone's different too. So I, I always everything I say is the disclaimer of like, or don't listen to anything. Or don't. Like, <laughs> or not. Yeah, like, <laughs> or not. You know, like go all in if you can. If you don't mind living on ramen, I do think once you have kids, it changes different story. The, yeah, for different sure. story a little bit too, but big time. Um, yeah, I I I respect immensely the people that do what you did and just jump in and go for it. It's just, it's advice that I don't necessarily think is sound advice for the best. It's horrible. Ad- it's horrible but- advice. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't tell people like to go, go, ahead. go through so much pain and suffering in this very fickle art market that like has so many kind of gatekeepers in it. I mean, I think that's the best part of NFTs times a million. Yeah. Like, Right now, there's like 10 galleries that represent about 75 artists who make like all like 99% of all of the money in art. Mm -hmm. And it's like kissing up to those people just sounds horrible. It's really horrible for sure. (laughs) I've like, I've like, uh, I don't know about you, but I've like consciously avoided for the most part, just dealing with galleries. I sell most of my traditional art on my own website. I kind of own my mailing list, which has like 4,000 people. And I own my, my e-commerce stuff. And like, it's not necessarily the only way, but for me it works because like, there's no kissing ass of galleries. And I thank God that I, I was able to build that. You, um, you kind of hinted at like, you know, some of your success and whatnot and some of your, the things you've done. I really want to know the answer to this, Gabe. You ready? So you've had yeah. some, you know, just, just following you online on Twitter for the past year or whatever it's been, you've had some freaking crazy scenarios you've been in the middle of, right? Like I, I looked at one thing, I don't know how many months ago this was, you're like floating around on some kind of like anti-gravity plane or some kind of crazy thing. And you're with like celebrities and blah, blah, blah. I'm like wondering 
first of all, which ones kind of stand out as like, whoa, maybe you have some good stories on any of those, but also like, what was like, if you can remember or think about it, some of the first moments where you're like, is this freaking real? And like, where you're like, I made it, you know, like those kind of, I love those beginning moments when it was like still magical. It wasn't like normal or like it wasn't expected. It was just like, is this fucking happening to me? Are you serious? Like, this is ridiculous. Like, tell me some of those things. I'll just be super honest. Like that hasn't stopped. Okay. Like as far as that feeling, like, uh, maybe five years from now, I'll be this grizzled, like jaded vet. But like, I think some of when people see me and I'm just giddy and like, there's so few pictures of me that I don't have like a shit eating grin on my face. Like, <laughs> like it's cause like, I really am kind of living like it's way beyond I will say a dream. Cause like I truly did not have expectations of the art doing anything more than being my own meditation. Mm. So like, unlike you, I didn't like, this is literally beyond a dream in the sense of, I just didn't think that this ever, ever would be a thing. It was like, art was just going to be like, I don't like watching TV. I like listening to podcasts and painting. Yeah. So like, like for me, it was like, the, this is so, but to your point, like there's been just several things that just blow my mind. The one you mentioned, like getting to paint in zero gravity, <laughs> it's like, when you do stuff that like has never been in your like ancestors DNA, it's hard to describe other than like, like you feel this, like this energy that like, it felt a little like I got inception though. Cause like for a couple days after I was like, why am I walking? I can float. <laughs> <laughs> like this sucks. I have to walk. It's like Fucking gravity. Fly. Gravity. I'm used to flying. I like to fly <laughs> places. Um, I just think like that was the first probably crazy moment. I got invited at Bitcoin Miami to this like dinner. It was like 10 of us um, okay. with Paris Hilton. And like, I just hadn't, it's funny because like met most politicians. I used to work in the Senate, like, you know, all the politicians of California very, very okay. well. And like never got starstruck once by any of them. But like some of these, like, I don't know. Some of them aren't like A-list celebrities, but like I used to yeah. get in rooms a lot with like MC Hammer would be an early clubhouse, like retweeted me like every day. And it's okay. like, I grew up on MC Hammer and he's like oh, a yeah. Bay Area legend. So like, that's just an example. It's like, holy shit, MC Hammer retweets me out. Like, what is this <laughs> world? You're like doing the like, dance, like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, rat, like freestyle rapping in my clubhouse room right now. Like, what is my life? Yeah. And then like having dinner with Paris Hilton was like one of those times. Um, my favorite rapper is Pusha T. Okay. And I got in, I got invited to this, um, to this show he did at nft nyc and like i was front row rapping every lyric i don't think that many people there necessarily knew his stuff so he kept okay. nodding and looking at me like mm. this guy like who is this guy getting in it's like having that kind of approval from your favorite musician is like oh, yeah is like one of those like holy shit moments yeah um Stoics selling out after the the fuckery that was the the first day mint. I don't know how much you followed it, but we got yeah, hacked yeah. and everything. Everything looked bad there for twenty four hours, but like the fact that it kind of sold out instantly, even mm. even with that, was one of those moments of like, wow, I really have an army of people behind me sort of thing. I don't know if I had ever felt it quite that same way because you're selling stuff usually in these like 10 piece, 15 piece things. Mm -hmm. so you don't know if like your market is 16 total people and you just happen to sell to all of them or if you have a bigger market than that. And sure. Like once you like are able to sell to 1500 folks or whatever, it's like, like wow i guess i i've hit to the point where i have enough of a following to do sort of that thing dude that's wild 
just to, just to think about like those early moments of like, I'm sitting next to this rapper, or I'm like watching whatever. That's just, that's a part of all this that you probably like just um, take for granted, but you said you're saying you don't, I would think you get used to that, but that's, uh, that's just amazing. I know you said um, you, you, before we went live, you were saying you have some stuff going down with timepieces. Can you tell us about that? So um, Deepak Chopra wrote a, Dude, did yeah. a book about 25 years ago, like top selling book. Like the Which seven, one? It's been like 50. Yeah, his very first one, The Seven Principles of... Yeah. Damn it, putting me on the spot. And I, I've read but it. I forgot the name of too, yeah. I've yeah. read that one. The Seven... Damn it. I... Not the seven habits of highly effective people. That was a different guy. No, that was a different guy. <laughs> but time, yeah, time. Mag, Keith Grossman invited me to like, it's like reimagine a cover for mm. Deepak Chopra's book, and then it's okay. gonna be dropped with editions um, of of a, a, a bunch of different stuff. We got to do okay. Zoom calls with Deepak Chopra, which was interesting and fun. What? That's crazy. <laughs> me. That's like that's sick. I'm like such yeah. a self-help guru type of a guy like my audible is full of like Eckhart Tolle and T Tony Robbins and Wayne Dyer and all those guys so that's yeah, that's yeah. Super cool man so yeah doing that doing that drop next week that was yeah just one of these cool things that just keeps coming up like I just got invited to National Lampoon to do a drop with them like just these things that were like I grew up like Animal House is my favorite movie oh, yeah growing up. So oh, it's yeah. like, I don't were know. A, were you in a fraternity in college? I was not. You're not okay. It's weird in Wisconsin. Like I don't think I even knew one person in the fraternity. Like it was its own. It was like one street where everything was about fraternities. Right. And then they had like four bars that were like the fraternity sorority bars. Mm -hmm. Like my friends were all like the hippie kids. Okay. So I, it's like fish concerts and like stuff like that was my crew of folks. So yeah. it it was just almost like two separate worlds where I never once kind of participated in in that in that thing. Okay. Not that I'm against it per se, oh, but yeah. it just like wasn't just wasn't your jam. Wasn't wasn't my jam. Okay. Um, yeah. You had uh so talking about uh all these like spiritual guru guys, I was going to ask you, are you would you say you're a, have a you have a active spiritual life uh, cuz I'm asking because I I'm like super big into like law of attraction and and manifesting and all that. I'm wondering when I ask people that they're either like they poo poo it or they're like totally into it. I'm wondering which side you're on. I'm in the totally into it. Okay, cool. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you got to tell me. See um, I just got... see it all the time. Like I literally just more interesting people just keep coming and are attracted to to it. And I feel like so much of it is like, what energy are you putting out into the world? And then kind of this manifestation thing. I I mean, to get super woo-woo, I'll just put it out Please. there. I, I love it. Bring the, it advantage, on, bro. Advantage, <laughs> the, the advantage of being an artist now instead of in politics, I can just say it like it is. But yeah, I did ayahuasca for the first time seven years ago. Mm -hmm. And I had the clearest vision ever of becoming a famous artist. Okay. After like, like I said, that was never even a dream. And I'd never shown it anywhere. So like my first thing was like, well, I should at least open an Instagram, like listen to the whatever the ayahuasca said. So I just like right. started Instagram. Like, I mean, it took me a year to get a thousand followers. It wasn't like it was like instantaneous, like jump or anything, but it was yeah. just like started building a little traction there sort mm -hmm. of thing. And then last, so in February, 2021, I smoked some DMT with oh, my best man. friend how was that man amazing but I've i did it with my... my best friend since third grade dude and even and i it was funny because i hadn't had any vision similar since that first ayahuasca experience okay. and i never told him about the, the that ayahuasca experience but i was like we kind of debrief we're on a hike and like debriefing and i was like um i just had like i've only had it one other time but i just had this insane vision where mm. it felt like time wasn't linear and uh like i knew like it wasn't like uh i'm afraid it's like i knew that i was going to become a famous artist and then the very next day i learned about nfts and then within like six weeks of that i was like a top selling nft artist and i was like 
just I feel I just am living proof that the universe can kind of tell you things and going back to like I'm not so convinced times that linear because like I feel like I've lived and almost like felt what that's like and just kind of know that that is kind of the path that I'm on dude I love this topic bro <laughs> I'm like <laughs> I'm like so into spiritual stuff but I also love like quantum physics I love how it's so, sort of like uh, quantum physics is very much like for me uh, a scientific way to explain manifestation and um, I've had some insane you know manifestation law of attraction moments do you have like a would you say you have like an active practice with that whether it's meditation or like a vision board or like are there tools or practices that you do to sort of you know do this stuff you know manifest and create the world that you want to be living in probably not as much as i should i do think the art for me is that really okay like, i i attribute my art really to like almost like jazz like it's jazz. very stream it's stream of consciousness like i feel like miles davis picks up any horn and like it might be bitches brew or it might be Dude, kind of blue but freaking like, awesome man but like they're two different things but they both sound very interesting and cool to me and sort of like if you give me a pencil and a cereal box i think i can make something sort of cool out of it or yep. if you give me the finest paint supplies ever like i think i can do something cool with it but like i i it's yeah it's this idea of like stream of consciousness and just letting kind of things happen like they're supposed to I don't know other way to describe it other than like I, I try not to lose a ton of sleep like I, I'll rework paintings a lot right. but like it's never from this like I don't do the self flag flag elevation sort of thing I'm like this will work out it's meant to be like eventually this painting will be good or it won't, and I'll paint over it. I'm not going to lose any sleep over it. I, um, I, I love that you're uh, bringing up Miles, because that's like one of the genres of music I listen to most when I'm painting. I love how it like musically like takes you on different tangents, and then like one of the musicians will like do something out of the ordinary. The other musicians sort of follow them there, and it kind of goes in these weird patterns. And I, I can, when I'm painting, I catch myself like bouncing to like the bass quite a bit. And I was yeah. like, just like about a month or two ago, I finished uh, Flea's book and I was like painting and I'm sitting there listening to like the bass notes and I'm, I'm noticing my hand going and I'm like, the universe is telling me I should play bass. I went out and bought myself a bass and I'm like, yeah. I just feel like it's 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 such a great genre of music to listen to. But, you know, I, which brings me to my one of my last questions, which I love to know about. I love talking about this kind of geeky arts shit is a creative process like you had mentioned, you know, using or you know, partaking in certain substances and you mentioned spirituality and like uh, before I kind of jump into the question, like for me, I'm asking from a place where like early on in my like my art career, when things first started going places, I was like smoking a ton of weed. I, I didn't have kids at that point, you know, popping whatever, doing whatever. And it really does kind of open up portals and it's great. And then I at some point, you know, I, I became a dad and I'm like, I really can't be like fucked up with having kids. So I like kind of straightened up my act. And it's like been an interesting journey to try to like tap into certain places without using other things as like a crutch. You know what I mean? And I'm curious, you know, what your creative process looks like and how it may have evolved over the years. And if it's changed at all, like what does that look like when you're not like where ideas come from, what you do with them? Do you have different sides of you that are sort of having a political debate in your head where like that maybe like i know i've heard you um talk about like clean lines versus more painterly lines i'm, I'm wondering how that dialogue in your head plays out a lot of, it's kind of like those two styles like one's like kind of more basquiat i would say influence and one's like more clean lines picasso-esque type of thing a lot of times the process is i i love to use these one graffiti markers on canvas they're like oil graffiti markers yeah and and i'll i'll i love drawing on canvases and it's sometimes they just hit just just fine with just just those markers and mm -hmm. then i'll just leave it a lot of times it won't like it'll like oh i need to add some color and i'll put color in it and sometimes like it just still isn't speaking to me so yeah. then i make it real loose and kind of wild 
And then if that doesn't work, then I make it a collage and cover yeah. half of it up with like maggot. Like I kind of just like the process is like, let's make a cool image. And sometimes that just comes out like a lightning bolt and is just there. And then sometimes it's a multi-year process where like, yeah. I like, oh, I can't stand this thing and I don't even want to look at it for yeah. a while yeah. and then like two years later i'll take it down from like the attic and be like oh this had something going for it let me just see what an hour or two kind of going ham on it does and mm -hmm. like, so the process to me is like like i said it feels like jazz and experimentation at least I, I try to have like one new element whether that's just a new paint um color or a different um I don't know, colored, trying to see what colored pencils or um, like I'll read that someone uses what am I, the Chinese like crayon like things. I'm okay. blanking on the name. Like the oil like, pastels? Not the oil past. Like. No. Uh, I don't know. Okay. It, but it's this thing where like I hadn't heard about it forever. Then like I see that like some people are using it in their work. I'm like, let me sure, go to the art store and try to buy some of those yeah um and then it's just like kind of i think enough self-realization i think like some of the best artists like early on i was like one in 20 of my paintings i would say were good okay but i kind of knew i had a good eye for like what a good painting was okay and i think now i've just gotten to the point where maybe two-thirds or three quarters are like good okay but like i think what i've done pretty well is have like some sort of self-realization or self like awareness where it's like i'm not afraid to say something is bad either and scrap it sort of thing okay. i think some artists like everything i put out is genius i'm like yeah some of the stuff <laughs> yeah. works yeah, yeah some of the stuff works some of it doesn't and like like being a, like if you have a good self-critical eye i think it goes a really long way i feel like at some point especially if you're kind of spiritual as it seems like we both are like for me i kind of look at it like when i'm most tapped in to whatever that means like the zone is the corny zone everyone says right when you're kind of tapped in it feels like the ideas are coming from somewhere else like whatever that means the universe or yeah. kind of freaking ghost that's standing next to you who the hell knows right but it seems like if that's sort of your spiritual belief then if you have like a bad painting or like you know what it's not my fault it's came from somewhere else you know it's not my idea i'm just the guy holding the paintbrush so i like that yeah that knowing? feels about right yeah <laughs> you're like um you're kind of known to be like super prolific like you're cranking out work have you ever i'm curious like have you ever thought about like what would happen if i took like a month or two on one painting have you ever like prolonged the process to see where that journey takes you yeah i have i i mean I will say, like, I think where we're headed is, like, perfect art with AI. And I think, like, trying to get too much down the perfect art yeah. world, I think, is going to be a pretty big mistake for artists. Mm -hmm. Like, I think you're going to need to show your humanity. I think people are going to want to watch you live painting or you're posting your, your painting. Like, I think we're going to see this divergence between these perfect, like visual representations of stuff right. and i think people always want to like be supporting a real human with real emotions mm -hmm. and so i feel like i like leaning in on the like i think i have good lines but like every single time i'm done with a painting i'm like ah uh, there's that could have been a little bit more perfect sort of thing but i i've kind of come to terms with you need to have Im imperfections or just know that like we're five years away from probably like you never being able to make a painting as good as AI. So yeah. like, like, like be human. And so part of, to me, part of the humanity is not the perfect. It's like yeah. if I spend three months on something and like overwork it and make it too perfect, mm -hmm. I just feel like that isn't even my core of what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to like, and put energy onto a surface and it's like i almost don't want the energy on that surface to be like 
it has to be perfect in every way or you're not making it as an artist. Like, I just think like sometimes you see some of that work and Mm -hmm. it, it speaks almost more to torment to me than like this freedom that I'm hoping that the more of the world starts to feel and especially artists. Like, I think it's its own thing. Like you go see like a George Surratt, like Sunday in the park or whatever. It's like, that just feels like mental illness to me. Like, I think it's beautiful, but like spending five years, like on one piece, like and to do like 8 trillion dots, like, <laughs> like it just doesn't do anything for me. Cause like when yeah. I see it, I'm like, this is very impressive. And like, I don't think like, like a sane person would do this in a way that like, I don't know. I, I really like insane people though. So I don't know. I like I know. I mean I'm here. I, I, I say it and I even in my own head I'm like critiquing it. I'm like, I don't know if that's true. I mean, some of it is like, wow, I can't believe these people would put that right. much effort into something like that. That's awesome. Um I think it just also depends on why you make your your art. Like I don't make it to be perfect. I make it to like scratch an itch that's just there kind of constantly but like I do like the challenge of kind of getting a piece to where I like it and so for me that hasn't involved needing like months and months and months necessarily I mean to the point like some of them are three four years old but I haven't spent every day on them like I did something for three days didn't like it and Mm -hmm. then like come back to it yeah, I get that. I like I love all sorts of art. Like I, I love equally looking at a Van Gogh, but I also love when I went to the Dali Museum in Florida and it was like just seeing the meticulous blending and just insane, crazy detail. I, like that is psychotic, but I completely love that. But I, I also love, you know, some really lazy, super sloppy paintings, too. So it's I think, like yeah. you said, it's why you do it. And it's also like there's a historical context. Like I was trying to explain to my little kids at the museum the other day, like, why a certain piece is good or why a certain piece matters. And it's like, you have to, you know, take into account like when this piece was created and what was going on before that and where it came from. And like, there's a lot of like context to art in general. I feel like that people maybe don't always realize when you do walk through a museum, you know what I mean? A million percent. And I'll say, even for me, I don't necessarily have that content. Like I love going to museums, but I haven't spent a ton of time on art history like that isn't my that isn't my bread and butter necessarily sure. um mm-hmm. so i both am very fascinated by it and it isn't necessarily like something that i could wax eloquently on. <laughs> i got it i got it i want to let's uh i want to finish up with uh you know a lot of artists are going to be listening and i would love if you can kind of um kind of give your radar on where things are going with the NFT space, but then I'll also offer advice and I'm going to be super um, selfish and also ask for advice on artists like myself. Like I tend to take a little longer with my pieces. So I'm like wondering if, if a lot of the marketing and strategy that you have would apply for artists that are taking longer on their pieces versus someone that can crank out a piece quicker. Um, I'm wondering how that advice may shift and like, what advice you think would be most um, sort of helpful for artists that are listening in the NFT space specifically? I think one big thing is like making sure that you know that your pieces are going to sell. And I, I don't, I feel like a lot of folks put like a big addition and then sell half and then leave it up there. And I think Anytime someone can buy your NFT the next day, that means they'll never buy it, is my experience. Like, if I look at something and, like, oh, nothing sold, it, this piece hasn't sold for six months, there's three more editions out there, right. I almost never go buy it because I'm like, there isn't enough demand here. Okay. And so, I think demand is your friend. So, like, you can ratchet that up, but always, like, I think a huge mistake is just having like every everything I have available right now is on the secondary market. Mm-hmm. You can't buy anything from the primary market. And there's a few times that stuff hasn't sold right away. I've like gifted it to some of my top collectors. Like, cause I just don't think it makes sense. 
in this NFT market to have mm -hmm. a like anytime you have the supply, what you're saying is that there's not enough demand for your work. Mm -hmm. It just inherently tells people like this isn't a great investment. Okay. And so I think understanding your demand is I think one of the most critical factors. So if that means having to lower the addition size or lower the price, I mean, I think it's just trying to really figure out exact, like what's the most you're kind of, you can demand. I mean, the other thing for me is like, I priced almost everything at about 50 to 60% of what it's worth as far as like, typically my stuff will sell out and then within a couple of days someone will have sold one for say if i sell it for 0.22 ETH, usually someone will sell it for like 0.38 after buying it and holding it for a couple of days yeah so like what that tells the market is like it was worth this which just equals demand because then the next person like well if i can buy this at 0.22 and instantly flip it that means there's like a demand there right and so i think sometimes people overprice their work for vanity versus understanding that if you let collectors win then that's how you have a long career in this space if like i really don't like auctions i think auctions like essentially charges people the maximum that the the market will bear which is fine i guess but like it just sets you up to like, but we talked about it earlier, but like, I just don't want to be beholden to like a couple rich folks, like mm -hmm. the big time collectors, some of them are pretty weirdos and they have this controlling thing. And then if you ever sell something for less, right. And they're like, get mad at you. Mm -hmm. like that's why I've done, I've done almost all editions instead of one of ones, because I just think like I can control stuff at, a few hundred dollars and i i also don't feel like i want to do right by all my collectors don't get me wrong sure but if you bought one piece for 300 bucks and now you're complaining because the floor price dipped 50 bucks or something mm -hmm. i just don't feel that beholden to you yeah like, whereas like i you know if you buy a piece from someone for 40 ETH, and then you see that the next day they sell one for 25 ETH. Right. you're like you feel like this i feel like just people get all weird so like i i just don't want to deal with any rich weirdos like i'd rather <laughs> just like i'd rather just be like an artist for the people who makes it like sort of approachable but then okay. hopefully make make some folks some money if, if possible like try not to let that affect everything you're doing but demand is your friend like a lot of times like I haven't done drops for months now, typically, but like when my early days, I'd be like, going to drop soon, DM me for details, DM me for details. And then like, once I had like 40 people DM me for a piece that I knew was only going to have 20, then I'd be like, okay, this thing is going to sell out sort of thing. And like, when I asked for details, I'd tell them like, I'll, get on my email list i'll make sure to dm you also right before the drop happens but like not setting these like hard dates because i think sometimes like i'm just dropping it on wednesday okay i'm like i i think it's more like keep putting that piece out and then when you know that there's enough like just kind of figure out through the response like what mm -hmm. the demand is and then understand that like half of those people aren't gonna follow through so whatever about half of like the DMs you got is probably about your like sweet spot for like how big your collection size or edition size would be. Like that's kind of how I at least approached it. So I kind of know beforehand that everything will sell before yeah before I drop it. How does that advice you just gave does that apply to traditional art as well for you? Or are you changing or tailoring? that advice in some way my my like almost the vast majority of my sales lately go to like a couple people who are are amassing very large Gabe Weiss collections I think this belief that it will 
explode at some point. Okay. I mean, I've had some wild buys lately where people are spending a ton of money on my work. But That's freaking awesome, dude. They, to your point, it's never through galleries. Like I, I try to, I, I welcome people to come do studio tours and get a talk with me. And then like, I don't think anyone's ever done a studio tour and not bought something fingers okay. crossed, but like, like I'd rather have a deeper relationship with the folks that buy my paintings. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a weird world where I, I, I don't think like that sort of, I will just say like, there's no place where you can find like a painting price associated with my work. And so like, I think it's almost the opposite of the NFT where it's all about the exact dollar amount. I right. think like I've never had anyone buy my work where they didn't try to like talk me down, which like I think is the worst thing you can do in NFTs is get talked down. Whereas mm -hmm. Like in traditional stuff, I just, it's like, I feel like a used car salesman, but I'm like, <laughs> it's like, you just know that haggling is going to be involved in it. So right. I never put prices out there. So they're not like, they don't get a like, well, you sold this last one for 30,000 and now yeah. you're trying to charge me 45. It's like, you don't know what I've sold my stuff for. And mm -hmm. this is what I... This is what like I won't be happy if I don't get this. You can take it or leave it, sort of thing. Okay. Yeah. But like, I think being in the position of not being thirsty helps a lot. Yeah. Like, these folks just came bought a lot of paintings from me, but they kept trying to haggle. I was like, sorry, it's a seller's market right now. I was like, <laughs> I'll call you. I'll call you when I'm in begging mode. But like right now, it's like like that's the price. And like they later told me it was like that's some of the reason that they end up buying more of them was just my confidence of like, like, I don't need your money. Sure. Like, that's this a is good, what it costs. Yeah. And, and if you don't, it, in. Yeah. It's like, if you don't like it, like, sorry, sort of thing. So like, I mean, I just think like the more you can ever be in that position in life, you're, you're better off where you're not too thirsty for, for anything. And like, so yeah, my, I have prints that you could see a price on, but like nothing, like I don't think there's anywhere where you could say like a Gabe Weiss painting costs this much. It's like the only way you're getting one pretty much is if you come and do a studio visit and then we kind of have some sort of haggling mm -hmm. and figure out pricing like sort of thing. Yeah. I don't know. I'm, I will say I'm not an expert on selling traditional art. I've just... I, I think I'm one of the very few artists ever who kind of made a name from NFTs and now I've sold my physical work. Like I had a big Instagram following, but mm -hmm. I wasn't selling. I mean, that on steroids, my wife would be like, you never get back to anyone. It's like, this person looks like a douche. I don't want them having <laughs> a pain. <laughs> like, it's like, so like... And my good friend, Ali Sabet, we were talking and it's like, he had like three paintings to his name because he needed to sell them to like, yeah. cause he's been a full-time artist for 10 years. So he needed uh -huh. to sell them to like feed his kids. Whereas like when I got into NFTs, I had like 20 years worth, I mean like hundreds of paintings that like had never seen the light of day, except maybe one post on Instagram. Okay. So I, I never came from it from like even thinking about selling them or gallery shows or anything. It's like the only people that got some were like people that constantly commented on Instagram were extremely right. friendly. And I was like, that person like has kind of like earned a painting. And sure. I guess I kind of feel like that still kind of like you got to earn it. You got to like come and actually see the work and talk to me. Like I just, I don't want this impersonal thing because like those people can mess up your market or take it to auction right away. And like, mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm, I'm big on no one kind of being able, like one or two people being able to affect your art career too much. Yeah. Is that, I, we'll wrap up with this, but I'm curious, like, is, is that important to you as far as like, do you want to be in that kind of traditional physical art world? Like, do you want to be, in like the shepherd fairy, you know, like Jeff Koons, like, do you want to be in those circles and like kind of 
kind of tagged into that question. Like, I'd love to to know where you sort of want things to go. I know you said you don't have like a traditional like vision board or something like woo woo, yeah. but I'm curious if you did have a vision board, where you would where you're currently manifesting, whether it's like subconsciously or consciously, where do you want things to go? And where do you see things going as far as career or life or whatever kind of is most prominent in your head when I ask you that? I really want to like have my work on like shoes and fashion and sweatshirts and hats. Like, I think I want to be a little bit more approachable than some of the folks that you named. Okay. Like, I think if I ever go that route, I want it to be a hundred percent on my own terms. And I know if I went in that route now, I'd be kind of still in the begging. I don't have a lot of shows that I can point to or whatever. So it'd be like, I, I just don't like to feel this feeling of like, like, please pick me sort of thing. Like, like, and so I think, you know, if Sotheby's called me tomorrow and said, we'd love to have feature four of your works or something for an auction, yeah. I'd be lying if I would say I would have, I would tell them no. I'd be like, yeah, get it. Yeah, let's yeah, do this. Yeah. <laughs> but also, but also like, I don't see myself reaching out to Sotheby's apps, I guess. So it's like, yeah. I just want, I want if bigger stuff happens like that, to kind of it come from a non-thirsty, like, like place because going back to i i don't like feeling small whether mm. that came from politics or whatever but i just think so many artists are in this like groveling thing that i just i don't think it translates well to selling your work long term but also just personally for me it feels so icky right. but like if i gotta i mean yeah the jeff like if my work was going for millions of dollars I would have a giant smile on my face and reinvest that in a lot of cool things that would make an impact on the world. Sure. But it's just to your point of like, I mean, there's something for manifestation. There's also something knowing that you're putting good shit out in the world. Like the thing I, the best advice I have for my kids and pretty much anyone on the planet is like, make the room that you're in better whether that that could be a Twitter spaces room. I mean, like, yeah. you know, think about it a little more abstractly than an actual physical room. But if you're in a room with 10 people, are you making that room better? Are you there complaining, making people feel worse about themselves? Are you like smiling big, making people feel empowered, giving mm -hmm. them like kudos or compliments? Like, I just think like, I want to be in a place where I'm always making the room better. And I know if I'm in a groveling place that I'm like being half of who I am. And like, I just don't think I'll be making a room better if I'm groveling. It's like, if that makes sense. So yeah, I want to, I want to be open to what the universe brings to me, but I also like this year is more about me trying to, figure out the two or three big things that I want to accomplish and not just letting stuff just come to me, try right. to be a little bit more like proactive. Mm -hmm. so I'm going to be starting a podcast. Nice. I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask you some questions. Cause you look like you have a good rig set up here and I'm yeah. very, very not technically sound. So I might, I'd, I'd be the guy like, can you just send me exactly what you have? And then I right. just buy, buy those things. Like I'm not the guy to like spend hours debating which microphone and be like, Jay had a dope one. It worked, <laughs> worked good. We're going yeah. what Jay has to say. <laughs> so big thing for this year is like, I want to do podcasts. I think it's like what excites me the most, like in a lot of ways about art is the conversation and the dialogue it brings. And so, yeah, um, to me, it's fun. Like this is, if I'm being honest, like a very good time for me. Yeah. Versus, like I think some people are like, getting interviewed and it's this horrible experience or nervous. Like I'm pretty comfortable in my own skin. It's like yeah. I don't just kind of say it like it is, and like mm -hmm. if I can be around cool people having interesting conversations, and I'm quite happy. So big. 
big point of emphasis this year is getting a podcast, try to do like once a week interviews with artists and different people sort of in the web three space. Mm -hmm. Um, let's kind of see, see where that, see where that goes. Um, started painting like nine feet by six feet sort of like, as like pretty large pieces. Mm -hmm. So I want to keep doing that because that brings a lot of joy. Um, those are those are two of the bigger kind of goals for the year and then kind of still working on the stoics trying to make sure that it it lives up to kind of my vision of like this community of people that are here for the long haul and kind of want to help each other mm -hmm. I don't know, you you mentioned fraternity before and it's funny because like I think I've done some of the best of any artist that's not in. I think you kind of know who I'm talking. There's like there's a fraternity at the upper echelons of NFTs, right? That I've been, going back to not groveling. Like I was just in Art Basel, and there's like the VIP thing. Like Gabe, hey, you can go up there. It's like, but if I go up there, I'm like feel just too groveling. Like I don't know. Yeah, like, it makes a, you feel douchey. Yeah, a little bit, right? So like yeah. I, I want kind of a fraternity of of people like more like minded. I think right. sorority too. I love I love working with women artists, but fraternity was just the word we used earlier. Yeah. Um, but just like this idea of like looking after each other and helping each other and going the extra mile to make sure that kind of people can live out their own dreams, like that the super goal of the Stoics is a lot more of that. I mean, I come from politics, but I mean, my job title is always community organizer, which okay. is to say like what excites me the most is seeing kind of people working together in cool, interesting ways. And if I can kind of be a catalyst for that or kind of create the sort of, I don't know, space for that, that's right. high on the list of like, so like Stoics for community, giant pieces to scratch my own artist itch and then to not just be too much of a lonely guy in my art studio i really want to do the podcast to just yeah. like almost like force myself to have interesting conversations because like yeah. i think twitter space is pretty shit for like actually having good thoughtful conversation i think I, i'm a clubhouse uh stand for life even though i don't go there now but like i just think Clubhouse to me was a little bit better at at having meaningful conversations than I see on Twitter Spaces. Mm -hmm. but I think like long form podcasts are kind of the thing that I personally listen to the most, and like where I think I can, I think I can make an impact doing it, and it's yeah. exciting to me. Yeah, that's kind of why I started it, because it does force you to have these kinds of conversations. And I think one of I'm sure you agree from the way you're talking, it's, it's like one of the downfalls of like the pursuit that we both have taken is like a lot of your time is spent like locked in a room, you know, like my kids are upstairs running around like when they're out of school and it's like you're kind of like secluded. And it's kind of like I, I love that and I thrive off that because I'm, I'm like half introvert. But the other half, I'm like super extroverted. Like I love chatting and I love I love having quality conversations. I don't like the fluff, you know, and like I feel like this kind of situation is like the closest I come to like having a conversation at a cubicle. Like most of my friends have like, you know, office conversations or whatever. And I don't really have any coworkers except for like clients, collectors, fellow artist friends. So it's it's really nice to kind of like talk shop and with someone that kind of gets it, even though you know, different, different paths, different, you know, pursuits, whatever. It's like, it is nice to have this feeling of camaraderie or like fraternity, like you said. Um, so yeah, I think you're, I think you're going to love that. It's great. And it's nice to be able to connect with someone to like, make you realize you're not as much of a weirdo as maybe you think you are internally, you know? I think that's exactly right. I mean, a lot of my work, like almost all of it is this very straightforward, like picture of a face. But to me, it's like all of the parts that are the most exciting parts of life really come from that. It's like whether it's us talking now or like a good conversation over wine or yeah. sex or like anything that's fun in life to me is almost this straight face to face sort of thing. And so like, yeah, that's why I've always been compelled to like do very straight on faces versus like 
Yeah. To I guess the, it kind of depends on what kind of sexual act you're talking about. It's not always face to face, but we won't go there. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> it's only missionary face to face for me. Okay. <laughs> only missionary style paintings uh, from Gay Boys. <laughs> there you have it. Yeah. Um, That's is the, the alpha of this episode? <laughs> There you go. You've heard it first, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Are there any um, topics, subjects, anything I left out, anything you want to touch upon, anything people misunderstand about you, anything else to, to wrap up that you feel like this conversation is drawn up for you? Um, I don't, I really don't like chilling. I will just say that like, I think for whatever reason we have with the Stoics kind of developed what I think is one of the cooler communities within nfts like so many people help each other we had this woman um janine who like had 22 stole of her nfts stolen and she's gotten 18 back from the community of different people in the community who bought them and then sent it back to her wow. i mean like like not to say that'll happen to you if you come in and get all your stuff stolen but all to say like if you're active i just think like I, yeah i'll take credit like i think i put out good vibes and i think i've surrounded myself with people that put out good vibes and i've been very mm -hmm. cognizant of not just shilling the shill or like doing stuff with people that i know could equal a pump but that then kind of compromises my values so um I'll just say, like, it's not about the money. I mean, I'm not going to get very much for becoming a Stoic necessarily like with royalties or whatever. And they're, you know, they're relatively inexpensive at the moment. But I will just say, I think it's a worthwhile community to actually be a part of. And not just because it's my art, but I think yeah. because of kind of the group of folks that has kind of embraced it people that have long-term vision, people who care about one another and aren't kind of in stuff for a quick flip. Awesome. So yeah, that's great, man. Um, we'll put all like your links in the show notes, but like where, where can people find you easily? It's like we have, I want to mention your handles, you're on Twitter, you're on Instagram. Where can people find you easiest? Those two, I would say okay. Instagram and, and Twitter. Twitter is where I spend a lot of most of my time instagram a little less though so if you want to have a conversation i would say reach out over dms on twitter is probably the one that has the best chance of me responding to awesome. i'm better at it sometimes <laughs> it's, not, it's not easy <laughs> man it's not yeah. easy juggling at all you know it's one of the things people don't realize coming into like art like when people dm you or i, I get a lot of dms like how do i make it as an artist or how do i do it at full time blah 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 and it's like People don't realize what it actually looks like, like the amount of time that you're spending on social media, the amount of time you're spending on stuff that has nothing really to do with making art. And so many people have misconceptions of like, if I'm going to be a full time artist, I'm going to be painting and like going to yoga class and just kind of floating through life, drinking tea with my friends. And it's like, no, you're going to spend a lot of time on social media, like packing up artwork and schmoozing and blah, blah, blah. And it's like it's it's interesting, isn't it? It's like such misconceptions. It's. I just had this conversation yesterday. It's like, what do you do? I was like, I'm an artist, but I would say at least half of the thing, I'm like a social media yeah. like, <laughs> guru guy. Like, I mean, I don't know. Like, I think it just matters. Like, I mean, maybe you'll get to the point where you don't need it as much, but I also like it. Like, I like interacting with, with folks. I think the last last thing would just for advice is like don't treat your collectors like ATM machines. Like mm -hmm. it's like have some humanity there. I don't know. Yeah. Like I'm I'm very close with a lot of my folks. Like and then do things that kind of surprise and delight. So like some alpha, some some people get one, but like my top like twenty five collectors I'm mailing this week. Mm -hmm. a book that I did of all my NFTs that also has the first page as a drawing that I turned into an NFT. So they're getting like a physical piece of work plus a book plus a nice note to them that's like all individually based on who they are. This is yeah. like, it's not like some canned letter. It's like 
and I could be wrong. I've only given one away, and the woman was one of my top collectors this last weekend was crying and so touched. I just like it's like be human with people and don't just just think of them as like your source of income. I just think like long term, my sense is that it will pay strong long dividends in your career. Um, yeah. So. That's a, it's amazing. Like what you just said, like this collector of yours was like crying. I think it's always amazing when people like connect with my work or your work or whoever's work, they connect with it so deeply that it's like, again, going back to the woo woo stuff, which I really believe in. It's like, I feel like when that work is coming to us as we're painting or drawing or whatever we're doing, there's like this energy that we feel that's like overcoming us. Right. It's like taking us over. And I feel like if, if like your collectors or my collectors can see our work and that energy is like transmuted to them where they can kind of feel that same feeling. And I think you're doing something right. I mean, that's amazing that someone's like emotionally connected to that same energy that you might've had when you were creating it, you know? So the universe, God, whatever, someone, something put this stuff through your head and made it shoot out your hands. Then that's pretty amazing that it like went to this lady in such a deep way, you know? <laughs> It was magical. So I was having lunch with her and her husband and my wife and I, and like my wife started tearing up too. But like, I, my wife is the brain of this operation. I still have never minted anything. I'm not that Web3 savvy, if I'm oh being honest. God. Like, she's like done all of it. So she's like, yeah. we're very, very, very much a partnership. But like, I'm the one who kind of gets the goes the events and kind of sees the impact or sees the tears or gets the love. And so like, it was really kind of this very impactful thing for her to almost like witness that she's a part of this thing that yeah. like brings out that level of emotion from folks. Mm -hmm. Like she's tearing up after this, this woman's tearing up and I'm like, I don't know, like there was something magical there. So yeah just i i think it all comes down to if we call it woo woo but like just try to create magic like yeah. be open to the fact that the world is very magical and that it's like cool interesting stuff can happen if you're open to it uh, that's yeah. painting in zero gravity or <laughs> hanging out with yeah. celebrities or like just having an experience where you get to see someone's like just you know, heartfelt emotion for being appreciated for who they are, and not just because they have money. I think for me, that's like the kind of the surreal experiences that I've had with like well-known people or celebrities. It's like it's it's magical on that level where you're like, am I really like talking to this person or do they really like like me? That's there's like the level of that. But then once you break through to that, I think it's even cooler when you realize that like those people, even though they have like a public presence, like they are seeing you as an equal. They are seeing you as a fellow creative person or like, you know, we don't realize that like these people you speak of, like they're seeing you as someone on a, on the less than common route, you know? And even though they may or may not be like socially at a different status in your eyes, like for them, they're also looking for people to connect with on those weird levels. And it's like, I think artists and musicians especially really need to understand like, we are all powerful. We are all empowered and we can actually, we, we should look at our own talents almost as if it's the talent is personified as though it's not us. Like when we see it's when we, when we like look at it every day through the mirror, it's kind of like easy to be like, Oh, I like to draw. Ah, I like to paint, play guitar or whatever. But other people are seeing us in a different way. And the more we can see ourselves through like the magic of other people, I think that's, that's a big key to it. You know what I mean? Couldn't agree more. I mean, I had a little antidote. Like recently, I got invited to Paris Hilton had a big launch party in in LA, and I, I just like told her the impact she had made because she made a little promo video. I did a quick drawing for her in Bitcoin Miami that she's like, "Gabe, that's hot." I saw like that a funny little yeah. little like video that she did for me, but like it was my pinned tweet for like a year, right? And so I and I got I think. It, I think it definitely helped me. So I made a point to tell her like how much it did help me. And she started tearing up. Like it's like even these billionaire heiresses, like everyone just wants to know that they're appreciated and that they are making an impact. I just think too much. We like think that these people are, aren't human, whether they're big collectors or other artists, like just don't be afraid to tell people 
like what they've meant to you sort yeah. of thing and i was surprised it made that much of an impact with her because i you know like i'm sure you get told you do nice things all the time because you're some billionaire whatever but like you just always been insanely nice to me and like so human and i right. just think like like i don't have a lot of experience hanging out with billionaires folks, <laughs> but like my one was like, this is just a regular person who likes to be appreciated for when they do something nice for someone. Yeah. So you have like a hundred percent satisfaction rate with all your billionaires so far, which is pretty cool. Yeah. So far, yeah, hundred <laughs> percent of billionaires like me. Five out of five know. billionaires prefer Gabe Weiss over other artists. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing i'm like um i don't want to take up all your time and i'm looking at my time i have to get my kids from school soon so i, I gotta yeah. wrap up but this was an awesome conversation i really appreciate you taking the time i, I think i first messaged you about chatting probably a year ago and we both finally made time for it and i'm like super grateful like everyone's um everyone that kind of told me ahead of time like down to earth nice guy they were all accurate so i appreciate you living up to the reputation <laughs> It's nice when you meet people take that it. kind of like it's cool when you meet people that have like a name for themselves in some way and they kind of don't ruin it for you, you know. So this has been a fun yeah. chat, brother. Thank you so much. It was a real honor. And I'm very happy I didn't ruin it for you. <laughs> <'cause that. laughs> awesome, man. Well, dude, enjoy the rest of your vacation and thanks for carving out a little time for us. I appreciate it, bro. And I'll we'll, uh, I'll see you on Twitter and hope we can stay in touch because I really enjoyed the uh, randomness of the conversation. I like the, how eclectic your brain works. It's really cool. I, I loved it. Thank you for the thoughtful questions. Had a, had a blast. Appreciate All right, it. All right, cool, man. Take care, Gabe. Peace, bro. Bye. Bye.